I'm Bailey Inman, and this is Gang and Get Your Gun. Uh, reading for Myrtle is Joy Murphy. Reading for Jed is Sean Kamen. Reading for Wes is Clint Abner. Reading for Anthony is Abel Cosentino. And reading for Natalia is Natalie Elizabeth. And our star of the day is Francis, played by Ellie Shaheen. All right. And here we go. Living room. A collection of Mayflower mob members in plain clothes mingle in a tight circles, plastic plates of food in hand. Myrtle, wearing sunglasses to cover her bruised face, nods off in a recliner. Her bodyguard, Ramey, is in the chair next to her, shoveling mac and cheese into his mouth. The perfect hostess, Natalia, walks around with an iced tea pitcher, refills cups. Francis enters, observes the scene, and rests a hand on Myrtle's sh shoulder, who jumps. Gan, Gan, you don't have to sit out here. Oh, it's all right, sweetheart. I like the noise. Francis hesitates, makes accidental eye contact with Ramey, and they quickly trade smiles. Francis walks through the living room to the foyer, where the French doors to the office are open, revealing Jed sitting at Myrtle's desk, consulting with two more mob members in the accent chairs. Francis peeks her head in. Jed abruptly stops mid-sentence, excuses himself, and meets her in the hallway. Who are all these people? You're Gant's friends from church. They don't look like friends from church. Come on, Jesus loved prostitutes, right? I just don't know if all of this excitement is good for Gan. She seems okay. She did make a list of some things she needs though. Do you mind running some errands? No, I don't mind. He hands her a list. Driveway. Francis walks to her car, parked on the curb, at first nonchalant. However, something doesn't feel right. She peers over her shoulder, but there's nothing unusual. Grocery store. Francis pushes a cart down an aisle. Once again, she senses she's being watched. She glances over her shoulders, but there's nothing out of the ordinary. Register. Groceries move along on the conveyor belt as the cashier scans and bags them. After another glance over her shoulder, Francis sees the cashier scanning a bag of Depends diapers. Oh, those aren't for me. I mean, I, I'm buying them, but they're not, they're for my grandmother. The cashier smirks, couldn't care less. Entrance, grocery store. Frances pushes her card out of the store as Anthony Bates approaches the entrance. She smiles. Why, hello, Frances. Is Miss Myrtle May home yet? She is, you should stop by. The whole church seems to be there already. Well, then I have to come, don't I? You take care. So sorry. Anthony watches her walk to her car. Once she's out of range, he reveals his concern. Across the lot, Francis loads groceries into the trunk of her car. Anthony pulls out his phone, dials. Hey, Ramey, it's your uncle, Anthony. I just ran into Francis at the grocery store and, well, I just have a feeling about. Suddenly, a gray minivan comes to a drastic screeching halt behind Francis. The sliding side door opens and out pours two masked abductors in black. Before she can register their presence, they grab Francis on all sides. She fights, kicks, screams, punches with no luck. The masked abductors throw her into the minivan and close the door behind them, speed away. Yep, they got her. Let Myrtle know I'm following these guys. But then a black SUV peels out of a parking spot and races after the minivan out of the lot. Wait, she's already got someone trailing her, it looks like. Never mind. Boyer, Myrtle's house. Natalia walks to the open French doors, phone in hand, interrupts Jed, Jed mid-sentence. Jed, it's Francis. Poplar Avenue. High-speed chase down a busy street as the gray minivan and a trailing black SUV weave through cars, run red lights, and cut off other cars to the soundtrack of a dozen honks. Minivan. Frances and the masked abductors bump around, unbuckled, toss it about in the moving van. She bites the best she can as the masked abductors bind her wrist together with a bike chain and wrap it around her neck to further limit her movement. They blindfold her and duct tape her mouth shut, muffling her cries for help. Jed's car, same time. Jed drives like a madman while Natalia loads her gun in the passenger seat. What do we got? Wes followed them into a parking garage on Monroe. South Main District? Latvians, I figured. 
I'm not far. We just need him to get her out of there. You'll take care of the rest, right? My pleasure. This is why I told mom, why I told everyone I didn't want Francis anywhere near the city this summer. Her subduction is always the hardest. Parking garage. The gray minivan spurs through an empty out of use garage. Suddenly more tires squeal and engine roars. And as the, as the black SUV rounds the corner and plows the minivan into a concrete wall, crash. Once the dust settles, we see one of the masked abductors face down on the concrete, crawling away from the crash. We follow the SUV driver from behind him as he approaches the fleeing masked abductor and kicks him in the jaw. The SUV driver turns to the open van door where another abductor raises his gun at him. The SUV driver grabs him by the collar and tosses him out of the van. We see a bound, blinded, gagged Francis lying, laying on the van floor, moaning in pain. The SUV driver reaches in to free her from her restraints, first her mouth, then her eyes. She blinks at the sudden rush of light, and when she sees the SUV driver, she recognizes him. Leslie? You okay? Anything broken? I, I don't think so. What just happened? Leslie helps her out of the van, her elbow, and guides her to the SUV. After loading up, they drive off. Moments later, Jed's car swerves to the scene and parks haphazardly. Jed and Natalia jump out, snapping on leather gloves as they walk. Let's get them to the docks. Wesley's car. Wesley drives as a, fr as a frazzled Francis rubs her wrists, still bound together. Are we going to the police station? Did you see their plates? In response, Wesley grips the wheel tighter. Were they going to kill me, do you think? Still radio silence from Wesley. Francis watches as they pass the precinct, suddenly sore. She tries to touch the back of her head with her bound hands. Your head? Yeah. Should we go to the hospital just in case? Wesley feels the back of her head. That's a pretty big knot, but that's good. It means it's swelling outward and not inward. Oh, cool. Hey, why didn't we stop at the police station? Myrtle's office. Perched up in her desk chair, Myrtle sips a, a caffeine-free Diet Coke with a straw. The other Mayflower mob members sit with bouncing knees and jittery hands. Ramey paces the length of the office. The walls rattle as the garage door opens. Gan Gan sets her drink aside and nods to the remaining mob members. They disperse throughout the house. Only Ramey remains. She'll be pretty frazzled, so perhaps you can fix her up something to settle her nerves, like water but you know, water. Ramey nods, exits as Wesley and Francis enter. Ramey and Wesley lock eyes and they're passing, exchanging unspoken words. Wesley helps Francis into a chair and exits briefly. What happened, hon? I was literally kidnapped. Oh, that sounds terrible. Wesley re-enters with bolt cutters. He kneels beside Francis and carefully works up the chain around her wrists. Hey. Grab me and put me in the van so easily, too. Like, they didn't even struggle. I was so light and easy to pick up, you know? Did they talk to you at all? No. Did they hit you or anything? Why aren't we calling anyone? Ramey enters from the glass of water. Drink some water, hon. Catch your breath. A little more. Doll, I wish I had more time to ease you into this, but it looks like the cookie isn't crumbling like that. Those people took you to get to me and my mob. The mob? My mob. Your mob? Yes, it's my mob, the Mayflower. I'm a mobster. Wait, we're Italian? And there she goes. Wesley, do you mind? Francis's bedroom, mid-morning. Francis blinks awake, face down, sprawled out on the bed. She's still wearing the clothes from before and a pair of Depends taped over her jeans. She touches the back of her head with a moan. She sees her bruised wrists, remembers, and freaks out. Myrtle's office, later. As she writes on her floral stationery, Myrtle eyes a gift-wrapped box on the corner of her desk. 
Still in her diaper, Frances enters, stands on the threshold, very zombie-like. Is it still Thursday? Uh, no, hon, it's Friday. Turns out tranquilizers don't pair well with minor concussions, but we know that now. Frances notices the beautifully crafted note tied to the box with a ribbon. She opens it. Dear Lily Pearl, real dick move calling in the Latvians to do your dirty work. Consider the contents of this box a token of my intolerance. Frances looks closer at the box, sees the blood splatter along the rim. Is that a head? No, just some fingers. And a tongue. Frances suddenly needs to sit down. She grabs a hold of a nearby chair, but Myrtle stands abruptly, stopping her. Oh, let's go sit in the kitchen, you know, on the hardwood chairs. Kitchen, later. A huge calligraphy, bless this home sign, hangs, on the, hangs over the long barnwood table where Frances is seated, cradling a mug of coffee. Her eyes are wide, glassy, and unfocused. At the kitchen island, Jed pours coffee for himself and Natalia, who's hunched over on the bar stool. Ramey helps Myrtle get settled in her chair at the head of the table. Does Aunt Lene know? No, it's safer the fewer people know the better. That you're in the mob. Ramey's been my right-hand man for a few years now. He's from the Memphis Brotherhood. We formed an alliance in the 70s and we merged members. But Natalia is third generation Mayflower. Hard to believe we've been around so long. From her spot at the island, Natalia nods, her giddy facade of long gone. She now seems sharper and fiercer in the embodiment of badassery. Wesley enters from the back door with an armful of groceries. Frances immediately diverts her eyes and blushes. Wesley follows suit in avoiding eye contact. Jed notices. And you know Wesley, we hired him when you went off to school, just as a precaution. You two slept together, didn't you? What? No. <clears throat> Wes, you were given strict orders not to sleep with my daughter. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Okay, wow. You're sleeping with your bodyguard. No, I'm not. Have you two ever? Can we? Get back to the mob stuff, please. Right, sorry. So back in 2007, right before the recession, Mayflower started running guns and we had a substantial increase in revenue while everyone else's livelihoods were plummeting. We needed a new front to cover our tracks. So we laundered money through the 10 Sweethearts pageant enterprise. John Allen and Lily Pearl Sutton were our bedazzled money mules. We put money into their pageants and they returned it to us through you as cash prizes. The pageants were rigged? Obviously, no offense. And it worked for a while, but we had to pull out of the deal when you pulled out of the pageants. Their business dwindled and they eventually shut down. But just before he died last June, John Allen confessed to skimming money off the top of the stack. Lily Pearl's taken it and built a multi-level marketing company. Not only that, they had help. Someone in our own camp had to authorize those transactions. But if it's all in the past and he's dead and her company's already built, why should we? No, oh, no, 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 no. Something wrong, didn't they? No, it's not the money. It's the principle. They've set a precedent that says our allies and our enemies can take advantage of us. And we're about to have a transition of power, so... Who? Leading a mob? Well, don't sound so surprised. What we're trying to say is if there's ever a time our enemies are looking for a weakness, it's now. We have to find out who helped John Allen get away with it and make an example out of them. So, we have to treat this like we have a traitor in our midst. Jed and I were going through all our connections, one at a time, shaking them down for information. But we have to tackle this from both sides. What can I do? 
I need you to sign up for the pageant. Ew, why? There's still a chance we could win the money fair and square through a good old fashioned dirty campaign. I thought you said it wasn't about the money. You're right, it's not. It's about you bluffing, showing little Pearl Sutton that we're still in control, no matter how many Latvians she sends to stonewall us. But I don't want to be a front for anything anymore. I want in. <laughs> <laughs> she wants in. <laughs> oh, come on, Mom. You can't seriously be considering. Hun, you have to remember that once you're in, there is no leaving. Okay. Mom, no. Tell you what, what if we treated the pageant like your practice round? Show me what you got. Find a girl to campaign for and you blackmail and seduce and mudsling her way to the crown. I can do that. Okay, but if you're going to do this, I need you on your A game. I'm talking big curls, acrylics, heels, all of it. Even if you don't like that stuff anymore, it doesn't matter. You fake it. You think you can handle that? I need you to say that you can handle it. I can handle it. She can handle it. We'll see. Tension slowly dissolves. Everyone sips their coffee and notices a peculiar smell they didn't notice before. Maybe start with a shower. Oh, yeah. I'll go take my diaper off. Frances stands, revealing she's still in her diaper and exits. And that's the scene. <laughs> <laughs>